Yeah, good day to everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here and to give you now my presentation on the legal classification of new plant breeding techniques. I think it fits in nicely with the presentation which Mirana gave. Um, I will also focus on policy, but my main focus will be on uh, the legal aspects. And I hope that's not too boring and not too complicated, <laughs> because the EU law on genetic engineering is very complicated, believe me. I've been working on it now for five years, more or less, and I, I still haven't understood it completely. Um, before I, yeah, okay, not the only one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before I go into it, uh, just referring to Nirvana's talk, uh, when I now talk about new plant breeding technique, it's important that we see this not separately, but as part of a system, uh, of an agricultural system. Yeah? We have with the genetic engineering and now with the genome editing a very fast development. Right? Uh, it's hard to imagine a new technique or which has been, or a new technology which has been adopted in agriculture with such a high speed like the GM crops. I was in the United States in the mid-90s and that's when they started. They showed me a uh, little garden where they had uh, GM cotton and GM soybeans. It's just very much in the beginning. Now 20 years later, 80% of the GM crop or the GM soybeans grown worldwide are GM. 70% of the cotton grown worldwide is GM. So this is really a fast rate of adoption. So th this has to be seen uh, with two other lines where we have a very fast development, and that's one with mechanization. We are getting there in a two new area with the robots. We have robots now, for example, in the barns, which milk the cows. But now the robots are starting to get on the fields. There are prototypes now. Uh, they, they kill the weeds. We don't need pesticides anymore or herbicides. They, they kill the weeds. They, they go slowly, you know, day after day, crawl over the field. There's nobody on the robot. And they stamp the weeds into the ground. They spot them. Or they laser them if they have roots. You know, go away. Then it's not, not sufficient to stamp them on the ground. Then you can laser them away. Yeah. It's very much in the beginning, this technique, but it's, it, will be, it will be coming. And then this is closely connected with big data, you know, because those robots, you have to steer with GPS and so on. And the farmers will use a lot more big data than they uh, do today. And there are people who are saying that the farmer will not be anymore in the field. He will be a chief executive's officer in his office, and that's from where he directs the farm. And uh, if you think that's not the future, um, you know that the German Bayer company <coughs> just offered to take over the American company Monsanto, which is the biggest producer of GM seeds worldwide. And they offered the staggering sum of 59 billion euros, not million, 59 billion euros for that, for that company. And that's the highest sum which has ever been offered in the history of the Federal Republic of Germany for a takeover by one company of another one. And Monsanto has in the past done a lot of investment in big data because they know this connection between biotechnology and big data is very important. Yeah? And that was also, I think, as my personal view now, knowing that pesticides are not the future but biotechnology Bayer is also a big producer of pesticides. That's why they thought they have to take that company over. But that's a personal belief. So this so far for the introduction, we are talking here about a very, very important topic. Now I hope, yeah. I, some slides I will go through very quickly because we have heard about this stuff today, uh, yesterday and today already. This is just a, a brief overview of 
which new plant breeding te techniques we are talking about. And the uh, yellow circle are the genome editing techniques. Most of these techniques have been dealt with by the EU working group on new techniques, which publishes a report unofficially, January 2012. The European Parliament has asked for an official publication. has never happened. Um, the important question to ask, which I will focus on today, is does the use of a certain new plant breeding technique generate a GMO? GMO, that's the legal question. And uh, before I get into examining it, I like to give a few words or say a few words why this question is so important for the agricultural and food sector. It's relevant for crops, fruits, vegetables, ornamental plants, trees, insect research in agriculture, biotechnology, in contained use and on the field. And when we do this legal classification of plants, we should always keep in mind what does it mean for the animals and what does it mean for the microorganisms. Yeah. Especially we in, in the EU law, we do not have an extra definition of GMOs for animals. Right? So we have to be careful, and um, genetic modification of animal, m animals, especially of farm animals, there's even less ex acceptance in society than with respect to plants. I sometimes think it might be different with respect to pets. To have a nice little dog in a pink color, maybe that's acceptable, easier, <laughs> than a genetically modified goat or, uh, uh, or a cow or whatever. With, without the horns, we saw that yesterday. And um, we have these fluorescent fish already. You know, they come in to Europe once in a while, but they're of course illegal, and you have to take them off on the market. But in Germany, we cannot kill them because of our animal welfare law. So we have to find a place where they can live. <laughs> Sometimes research <laughs> institutions ask for <laughs> to give them to them. Um, okay, this is important to keep in mind. Um, if we say yes, the genome editing uh, or the uh, plants uh, generated with genome uh, editing techniques, what consequences do we have? We have this intensive risk assessment and lengthy and costly authorization process under EU law and the traceability requirements, which then, of course, will ensure a high safety level. But, of course, from what I know, it costs several million euros to get through the um, authorization process at the EU level. And if you're not asking for import authorization, but for an authorization for cultivation, uh, you have to be careful that you're not a dead person before the authorization is issued, right? Because some of them are now, uh, uh, the applications are older than 50, 15 years, right? <laughs> and still not decided. And the European court said, you have to make a decision. I remember about three years ago, I think, on the May 1507, still no decision. But now they are uh, in the process, at least three of them are in the process of getting a decision. Anyway, so then you have the application of the cultivation directive. I don't know if you're aware of this. This gives the member states the possibility to prohibit um, the cultivation of a GM plant uh, on grounds which are not connected to risk. That's an interesting, interesting <laughs> approach. It's very new. And I don't know what it means for the future, but it was passed after heavy debate. Germany belonged to the blocking minority for many years, but now it's there. And actually, we are transposing it at the moment into uh, national law. Uh, yeah, I often think, what does it mean for other products if third countries take the same approach for EU exports, like the United States now, perhaps, when they look at our legislation here? Say, well, it's, we know it's not risky what you export, but we prohibit the use for social economic reasons, for agricultural policy reasons, for environmental policy reasons. That's what's written in the directive. The contained use directive will apply. Uh, those of you working in the laboratory, be careful. There, it's usually easy to say, well, you don't really have to deal with the question. You say, okay, it's a GMO, it's just level one or level two, no problem, I fulfill this requirement. But when you then want to go outside in a field trial, and then you experience all these difficulties, and then you want to say, oh, no, it's not a GMO. It's difficult to reverse your 
opinion if the inspector has always been dealing with this as a GMO. So this is very important here um, at this point, at this stage already a decision is made. Um, then uh, if it falls under the EU genetic law of engineering, then it's very unlikely that we have, will have cultivation in the EU. No company after this cultivation directive was passed will, I think, in my opinion, ask for a new authorization. Because you know you invest these millions of euros, and then you have <laughs> above this possibility of member states. You know the government changes, and they start to think, "Oh, I have for agricultural policy reasons or social economic reasons, they must be compelling." I know I don't want to get into details here because then I would talk for two hours. But anyway, uh, they, it's too risky for them. Yeah, so I don't expect any more. We have six still there. Two have been withdrawn. Six and three we are dealing with them at the moment. Uh, we have a very, uh, if it's a G GMO, we have a very Im bad impact or negative impact on public research. Um, uh, but also, of course, as first, the first place on industry research, we experienced that in Germany. You know. BASF left with the research. Bayer left with the GM research. KWS is building a new research center in near St. Louis. Yeah. They are withdrawing it from Germany, so they're all gone. If we give some money to universities, um, like the Helmholtz, <laughs> then of course they'll, they'll, they'll do it, yeah, they'll work on it. But from the industry side, we shouldn't expect much in Europe anymore at this point of time. Um, a concrete example here, in Germany, we had field trials with GM plants in 2000, about 227 sites. Since 2013, it's zero. And uh, of course, a lot of big, uh, we have fields destroyed and so on. Uh, NGOs were very successful here, but it's also due to uh, legislation. And we are losing know-how, especially what, with respect to the risk assessment. We then talk about risk assessment, but we have to get the studies from other countries. Because uh, in the fields, where does it come from? Maybe from Spain, yeah. There are some southern field trials in Spain, yeah. But not very many anymore in Europe. It's going down. That's not good. We have a decision by the federal parliament. We must man maintain the competence on, on, on research and on risk assessment and, the, and, and to evaluate the chances, the benefits. We must maintain this. And there was a huge discussion within the cultivation directive because of that for us. OK, and then of course, as I pointed out, it becomes less attractive for certain investors, especially for small and medium enterprises, for startups. If it's a GMO, it's impossible for them to get on or try to get on the market in the U EU. Um, if no, then all these, most of these consequences are not there, at least not in to the extent I have described, because this intensive risk assessment, lengthy and costly association process, and the traceability requirement, which is also in the monitoring was mentioned by Nebena, uh, is also an important thing. But if it's not a GMO, and that's I want to point out, and I see I have to be more quickly, otherwise I won't finish within half an hour, then there's still a lot of other laws in the European Union will apply. And the most important one, I think, is the first one, laws on the safety of food and feed. Um, you know, when we grow these plants and process them and bring them on the market, I mean, they need to be safe. That's what our uh, law says. And, and if, it, if they're not safe, then the company is subject to uh, even fines, you know, they have to pay damages and so forth. And all neighbor law is important for coexistence. You know, uh, it works with the uh, um, herbicide tolerant uh, uh, plants we are growing in Europe. I think we are growing now over 270,000 hectares. In Germany, I think it was 30,000 hectares, especially of herbicide tolerant um, uh, rapeseed, and in France, I think a lot of sunflowers. In the, in the, uh, the High Court, this uh, Conseil d'État said, I think 22% of the sunflowers in France are now uh, herbicide tolerant with conventional mutagenesis. So now, when you, before you apply the law, you have to get to the findings of fact. The facts need to be established. This is extremely important. Don't underestimate that. Usually, you know, in legal proceedings, this is the big part, the hard part. Then the law, to apply the law is not that difficult. But often, of course, it's difficult to find the, the facts correctly. Uh, and um, 
that is where the scientists come in, I think. They, you, you as a scientist have to get the facts right and produce convincing evidence that you are right. right? That's important for the court. Uh, like the European Court of Justice, I'll get to that later. He, he's dealing with a case on uh, genome editing now. Of course, then we have differing views sometimes, but that shouldn't, wor shouldn't worry us because it's the same with the, with the lawyers. You know, we always have minority views. So, and now I'm going to go through a list where I think the scientists should do some work. Um, the first question is, um, to what extent does a point mutation which has been induced by a specific N new plant breeding technique differ from a mutation that has occurred or may occur naturally or has been induced by radiation or chemicals? This question needs to be examined thoroughly. And um, it's important for finding out whether it's a GMO or not. It's important for the question whether it falls under the exemption of mutagenesis of the EU directive. Uh, uh, the release directive, and it's very important also for the WTO whether you have a like product, yeah, uh, and whether the rule on no less favorable treatment applies. You know, if you ex exempt conventional mutagenesis, but you don't have a distinction with respect to a, gene, a plant generated by genome editing, then the chances are high that you are uh, not complying with the no less favorable treatment clause of the WTO. The Technical, uh, it was mentioned by Nirvana, WTO, Technical Agreement on Barriers of Trade. Um, second question. Do seeds generated with a certain uh, new plant breeding technique pose a lower, the same, or a higher risk of harm than seeds generated by using radiation or chemicals? This question has not been solved. And the, uh, a lawyer cannot solve this question. It's a question of fact-finding. And um, if you can't give an answer and there's scientific evidence, well, it may be risky, so then the precautionary principle comes in. And the precautionary pr principle leads the court more to say, okay, then we, we need regulation, and they tend to put it under the GMO definition. It's important, um, again, for this exemption for mutagenesis, for conventional mutagenesis, when it was put in there. We have to now make a decision whether it also applies to the new mutagenesis, like. And um, important for the principle of coherence, that you, principle of coherence means that when you have about the same facts, then uh, for two different plants, you shouldn't treat them differently. You should, should the treatment, the legal treatment should then be coherent. Um, next question, which needs to be solved by scientists. Can the genome of a plant which has been modified by point mutation caused by a specific new plant breeding technique be restored via another new plant breeding technique caused or the same caused by point mutation at the same locus so that it does not differ in any way from the original plant? If you are able to um, achieve this, yeah, well of course there's this off-target effects, but I heard today and yesterday especially that <coughs> there's a good chance to get rid of these off-target effects. Then if you change an apple, let's say give, give it a different color, and then you use the same or a different genome editing technique to put, get back to the same apple you used originally, well, then I think it's difficult to argue uh, the second apple then is a, a GMO. And this shows then this process-based approach, which uh, Nirvana talked about briefly. I'll talk about it also. Um, <coughs> may not be the right approach. Um, anyway, so and this is, of course, also important for the application of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle, you know, you need also to apply this some science. It's, it's not a rule like a legal rule. It's a tool uh, to decide uh, legal questions. Um, next important question, which needs to be, I think, <coughs> answered by scientists. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, can an organism with a point mutation be identified as being a GMO, or can the mutation's cause not be traced back by analytical means? Um, we, we, we heard that. Um, 
that uh, the point mutation may have been occurred naturally or uh, been caused by conventional mutagenesis, irradiation, or by treatment with chemicals. Can you distinguish then? Uh, this is important um, for enforcing the zero tolerance uh, policy or law of the EU. You know, if it's a GMO, then you cannot market it out without an authorization. Right? Now, let, let's take um, the ODM uh, Cybus from the company Cybus, the rapeseed. It's grown in the US. Right? Of course, there's no regulation. Then you have uh, contamination of other rapeseed and so on by uh, uh, when the, the farmers plant this. And there's one farmer who plants uh, ODM rapeseed and the other one the conventional. And of course, uh, then uh, the, uh, there will be contamination. And then the rapeseed comes into the EU, and there will be traces in there. And can we trace this back to the ODM rapeseed? Or could it have been another cause? Uh, when you apply for an authorization in the European Union, you have to present a method of identification of your GMO. This is a prerequisite for the authorization. If you cannot present a reliable method of identification, you don't, do not get the authorization. Right? So if, this answer to the if the answer to this question is no, we cannot identify, then an applicant, even if it's a GMO, could never get an authorization. And then as a lawyer, you have to ask yourself the question, is that what the legislator intended? That you make a rule so people can apply for get an authorization, but you have cases where you never can get one, no matter how hard you work on it and how much money you spend. It's also uh, important for uh, national coexistence rules and, of course, for national penal laws. Uh, there, uh, the court will look even uh, more closely, take a very close look uh, whether uh, um, it was, in fact, uh, an unauthorized uh, GMO which you have marketed. Uh, now, um, this is the Cybus case, the famous Cybus case. Um, it has been in front of our uh, competent, author competent authority, the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety. Um, the company Cybus from California, <coughs> is a medium-sized company, I think has about 120 <coughs> employee employees, so it's nothing big like Monsanto or so on. And they asked us, can we make field trials with this herbicide uh, tolerant uh, rapeseed in Germany, and we were a member state which didn't r just write a letter, uh, informal letter saying yes or no, but we made uh, a formal administrative proceeding out of this uh, process, and the competent authority, the Federal Office of Consumer Protection and Food Safety issued an administrative act uh, saying it's not a GMO, mm -hmm. and they, in order to reach that decision, they interpreted the <coughs> EU GMO definition as being process and product based, meaning, okay, first of all, there was some artificial art alteration or some modification. So we had the process requirement is fulfilled, but then they, they looked at it, could have been this uh, been created by a conventional mutagenesis or could have occurred naturally? And they said, yes. And they didn't say that easily. It took them quite some time. They requested more data and so on. And they looked very closely at the data, which shows that you know, this is always a case-by-case -case approach. You cannot never say uh, a plant generated with CRISPR-Cas is a GMO in general or not. Then you have to look very closely how CRISPR-Cas was used or how, uh, uh, what, ha what happened when they, they applied ODM. You know, to, to get to this decision. Of course, once you have made one decision, then it's easier to make the next one when it's what comparable, same facts, and so on. Uh, but it's a case by case. Anyway, then a formal objection was raised that was rejected by the competent authority, and now it's in front of the administrative court in Germany. And I have <coughs> we have the feeling that the court is waiting <coughs> for the before it makes a decision for the decision of the European Court of Justice on mutagenesis. And that's my next case. You probably have heard about it, <coughs> that in France, uh, I think some farmers and, and environmental groups have uh, said that um, ODM is um, uh, not covered by the uh, mutagenesis exemption, and that even the mutagenesis exemption uh, is contrary to the law of the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. 
Um, so um, the court has to deal with this question. And I'm a little bit worried to tell you when I read the request by the Consul d'Etat to the European Court of Justice. And uh, these are, the, you know, it's going in a way where the precautionary principle gets a huge weight in the decision of the Consul d'Etat. I mean, the final decision has anyway been made in France, right? The court, European Court of Justice, will not decide the case, will only <coughs> give some hints to the Consul d'Etat how to interpret, interpret, interpret the European law. And what they said in their decision for the request for a preliminary ruling is harm might result from a direct modification of the genome, e.g. by ODM, because the same effects are produced, <coughs> or maybe produced with the introduction of a foreign gene. So they compared <coughs> the conventional immunogenesis with GM herbicide tolerant crops. Right? That's what they did. Is that justified? And the second is the possibility of harm might be increased because the development of the new techniques permits the production of modification of the genetic heritage to increase at a rate out of all proportion to the modifications likely to occur naturally or randomly. Randomly, I'm not sure 100% what they mean. If they mean <coughs> con uh, conventional mutagenesis, I don't know if that's right. But these two questions, uh, is the court right on this? And if not, um, I mean, scientists then should give, give an answer here. Otherwise, you know, this looks like <laughs> the court tends to uh, uh, put it under the GMO regime. Of course, no final decision yet made. Um, now, I have to hurry up. This is an uh, important thing I wanted like to draw your attention to. Um, we have a huge discussion in Germany on GM crops, un unfortunately, on the cultivation of GM crops. And um, yeah, the discussion among the politicians is heavily dominated by the views of the NGOs. Yeah, they, and uh, the yeah, non-acceptance in many parts of the population, at least that what the uh, politicians think. And um, <coughs> so I told you that we uh, were, uh, yeah, drafted a law. Actually, we did this, my unit did this on the implementation of the cultivation directive. It has been discussed, you know, we had to change it many, many times. Uh, now, but now it has been in November, uh, on, uh, on 2nd of November, it went through the cabinet and now went to the second house of parliament. And <coughs> there we had this big discussion on what's with the new techniques. Yeah? Do they fall under this directive now and then they're dead? Dead for good, I think, that's my, my view, in, in, in Germany, at least. You know. I'm probably in the European too, but anyway, <laughs> if it falls on the end. <coughs> and because, you know, I, th I, I said, if I go into the parliament, into the committee, and then the members of the parliament ask, what about the new technique? Do they fall under your law? And then I say, I don't know. I have to wait for the commission or the European Court of Justice to make a judgment. They may say to me, why do you present a law to me uh, where you don't know the scope? Yeah? So <coughs> we tried to settle this at least to, give, to get a German position. <coughs> now, I should say uh, this was negotiated at the deputy minister level. And when deputy minister, uh, I was part of the negotiations, but when they no negotiate sometimes, then <laughs> you get <coughs> results which you know, everybody can interpret a little bit differently. Right? It's a compromise. Uh, it says, first of all, I have the numbers there, case by case examination when you come with a genome or any plant or with a plant create, uh, generated with new breeding techniques. Then process and uh, product-based consideration and assessment. Now, we say consideration in, in, uh, uh, in uh, the law of genetic engineering, I must say, will be carried out for business under the genetic engineering law. Yeah? And this, for us, <coughs> includes a definition. <coughs> for the Ministry of Environment, I'm not so sure if they read it this way, but I think it should be read this way. And um, then the next big thing in there is the innovation principle. Okay? In making this decision, we um, take care of the precautionary principle, but also of the innovation principle. And we were, you know, where does this current principle come from? You know, we were accused of creating something new here. And actually, the innovation principle was passed by the council 
the European Co uh, the Council of Ministers on uh, 27th of May 2016. And um, I don't want to get through the, all the details, but um, now it's part of, for us, of the precautionary principle. Yeah? Um, <coughs> This is uh, from the Council conclusions, you know, what, what the innovation principle means. Um, innovation for us has always been, and I think Nevada made this clear too, uh, a driver for better environmental protection. You know, we have emission and noise reductions, renewable energies, electromobility, and so on. It all comes from innovation, and it protects, helps to protect the environment. So why shouldn't that system not also work in agriculture? And in particular, why shouldn't it work for plants? Yeah. So just to make one thing, because we were criticized very heavily, having introduced this, it actually came from the Ministry of Research. They wanted to have this in there. Um, we said the innovation principle <coughs> does not weaken, but strengthen the precautionary principle uh, for the reasons I've stated above. And then there's also a legal safeguard. The precautionary principle is uh, legally binding by the Article 190. One paragraph two of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union and the innovation principle is council conclusions. Yeah. Um, so my, my take home measures, is, and I think I'm actually within time, I'm surprised. <laughs> of course, I could have talked longer. But um, my message is scientists, please get involved. This is a very important development here, and we need your advice with respect to the findings of fact. Yeah. Yeah. You are the ones where the facts come from, and you should also have uh, supporting evidence for the facts which you claim are there. I refer back to my questions. Um, as I said, this is crucial for obtaining the correct legal results. If you don't have the right facts, you're very much likely not to get uh, the right legal uh, uh, result. The Commission knows this, and they are referred, I don't know which questions, but the whole issue was referred to the um, Scientific Advisory Mechanism, SAM. And uh, Commissioner Andrew Kaitis wrote this to all the ministers uh, uh, just recently uh, of the member states. Uh, and he said, well, we expect uh, by the m in the second half of 2017 that um, this uh, uh, Scientific Advisory Mechanism will come out with some advice for us. Um, if it's only this mechanism, then the Commission has a lot of influence. Right, and the member states have little to say, because in my opinion, they are busy with finding the facts. Yeah. And um, then we should, since we have this council decision now on the innovation principle, uh, um, we should uh, work that it becomes an important part of the precautionary principle. Actually, the precautionary principle is mentioned in these council conclusions on the innovation principle, just very briefly in a footnote. Uh, Tr trying to indicate that we don't want to weaken it. Yeah? And um, this is the final question. I think it's also very, very important. Um, you have to ask the question, what are the consequences if one neglects the innovation principle because of the application of the precautionary principle? What are the consequences? Yeah? There are not only benefits, but when you uh, don't act, uh, you also have consequences, and, and I think Nirvana, in her especially introducing remarks, showed that it's not five minutes before 12, it's five minutes or 10 minutes after 12. And then in one last word, and then I'm, I'm finished, uh, some people think, oh yeah, you know, uh, there's genome editing, now we have prohibited it, but we can of course allow it. And then we just turn the switch, and then there will be the plants. <laughs> no. From starting the research to get the plant on the field as a crop, it's usually over 20 years. And this genome editing is only a small part of a few years of this whole process. Don't forget that. So we are late. When you look at the numbers 2030, 2050, you know, uh, luckily some other countries in the world take a different route. Thank you very much. <laughs>